speaking on pseudo dementias and it's uh, remote Thank you. And uh, the last speaker, Dr. Weiss, was talking about frontal lobe dementias. And in frontal lobe dementia, we <coughs> talked about pseudo-psychopathy. Uh, frontal lobe dementia sometimes reminds you of a mental illness. And so, so people talk about pseudo-depression, pseudo-mania. Uh, in other words, neurodegenerative disease can imitate these uh, supposedly uh, functional or mental uh, disorders. Uh, but I have a feeling that basically, if it walks like a duck, it's a duck. You know, the brain can only do so many things. And if you make, make, uh, mess the brain up, then it's going to default to one of these other behavioral styles. And that's why a neurodegenerative disease reminds you of <coughs> mental illness. And conversely, mental illnesses can remind you a lot of uh, dementia. So the real talk here is the true dementia of subsyndromal depression. And this has become a hot topic because people are uh, recognizing uh, low levels of depressive symptoms may be a particularly early feature of dementia, like Alzheimer's, and may actually indicate uh, that you're at risk for conversion to dementia in the near term. So the key points is that, first of all, depression has effects on cognition. Don't think of it just as a mood disorder. Uh, depression affects your thinking. And uh, it also affects functional status. Uh, the World Health Organization thinks depression is one of the top 10 disabling uh, medical conditions uh, known to man. <coughs> and uh, uh, this uh, trouble with functional status may come from a particular network in the brain that is implicated in both depression and uh, dementia, called the default mode network. And I'll tell you the uh, significance of that in a minute. And, uh, you know, what would be interesting is uh, we have drugs for depression, but we have no drugs, really, uh, really effective drugs for dementia. So if depression is a potentially disabling cognitive impairment, it's arguably dementing. And if we have drugs that fix that, we have anti-dementia drugs. And they're FDA approved, so why aren't we using them? Right? You're just going to get held back by... Uh, by the idea that dementia has to have plaques and tangles involved for it to be dementing? Or can we take a lesson from the page book of treating depression and bring that into dementia treatment? So, uh, is there a depression of Alzheimer's? People are talking now about the, the depression of Alzheimer's, or really it's usually subsyndromal depression. But basically, depressive symptoms have been identified in Alzheimer's and in pre-Alzheimer's, mild cognitive impairment, the presence of depression symptoms hastens conversion to dementia, right? And uh, so it doubles the risk that you'll, be, you'll convert to clinical Alzheimer's disease in the near term. And, uh, and so people are starting to wonder whether this is a, a, a neuropsychiatric expression of the Alzheimer's uh, process. And uh, we also know that Depression, even you don't even have to have major depression, just subsyndromal depressive symptoms predict future cognitive decline in non-demented people, but not on every cognitive measure. It's most likely to be uh, <coughs> through tests of executive function. And uh, we've demonstrated this in the Air Force villages here. 
in non-demented, healthy, uh, you know, affluent, highly educated super seniors out there at Air Force Village, and their uh, non-symptomatic depressive symptoms predicted the future rates of change over time in specifically executive tests. Uh, and this looks like a scary thing. Uh, I, I want you to notice, I was thinking about this watching Dr. Weiss present, uh, a lot of people who present have nothing but words on their page, and I tend to think in pictures. So my slides are full of pictures. So I'll have to walk you through this. But this is, uh, you can my pointer, which I said, oh, there it is. Uh, this is a model, this is called the structural equation model, uh, which is not rocket science, but basically, uh, you have squares or things you actually measure, and circles are uh, what are called latent variables, like factors. You don't measure them directly, but they're inherent to what you actually did measure. And uh, so what we got here is, uh, on the left, that circle is uh, a growth curve of change in cognition over time in a data set in Hawaii. So we're looking at the change in hundreds of people, thousands actually, of cognitive performance on a test a lot like the mini metal over time. And you get an intercept and it predicts a future slope. And the slope is being adjusted for age, medications, body weight, and education. And then down here is the depression rating, the CESD, uh, which is a, a clinical uh, rating scale for depression, pretty easy to do. And we're looking at its effects on change in cognition over time. And then we have pathology and autopsy. And uh, that's tangles, Alzheimer's lesions, measured in different brain regions. And I have all of the different brain regions relating back to a latent <laughs> factor, which would be just how bad is your tangle pathology? Because, you know, tangles are very uh, regionally precise in the parts of the brain they attack. And so you can have a high number in one region and a low number in some other region. So I, I just give you what they share, which is basically the Alzheimer's process. And the dark lines are significant. So what this is showing you is that depressive symptoms are related to uh, the rate of change in cognition over time, but that effect is independent of tangles. So tangles affect cognition, but so does depression. And the two add to each other, one doesn't mediate the other. So I don't think it's true that there is specifically a depression of Alzheimer's disease. Alzheimer's pathology predicts cognition independently of depression. But the depressive contribution is stronger than amyloid. Now, everybody's looking for drugs to fix amyloid, but we don't got them. What you do got is uh, antidepressants. And the cognitive impairments of depression are as strong on your total uh, cognition burden as the amyloid lesions, and independent of them. So basically, I say you ought to consider going for what you can fix and worrying about these other things you might be able to fix <coughs> one day in the future if uh, some drug company drug strikes at risk, I mean rich, uh, just worry about that later. But in the meantime, we have a known quantity, depression, which can affect cognition and affects it as strongly as Alzheimer's lesions. And, and yet we don't think of antidepressant treatment as a cognitive treatment. We tend to think of it as mood or quality of life or, or something like that. But depression has cognitive effects and so we should fix them. Anyway. So depression, I think, is a potential dementing illness in its own right because it affects cognition cross-sectionally and longitudinally. Uh, but is it really dementia that it's fixing? Or is it just you know, forgetfulness or something that's not dementia? And uh, to do that, we have to think about what exactly do you mean by dementia? I mean, dementia isn't really just cognitive impairment. There are a whole lot of cognitively impaired people out there who are not demented. So, Cognition, uh, cognitive impairment is just one part of dementia. On top of that, you also have to have disability. And then furthermore, the two have to be related. So sure, there are people who are both disabled and have cognitive impairment, yet they're not demented because you can't show the two are related to each other. And uh, so, uh, so basically the real question here is, do depressive symptoms disable you through cognitive change? 
Because if they do, then depression is a dementing illness. And it's a dementing illness that is on top of and independent of your Alzheimer's pathology. So, we, I just showed you depression is associated with cognitive decline, but is it disabling? And the answer is yes. The World Health Organization, like I said, has uh, uh, surveyed the causes of disability worldwide <laughs> used to rank order diseases based on mortality. And depression also makes that list because it's associated with uh, survival time. But independently of its effects on survival, depression also is related to disability. Uh, there is a whole literature on this. Uh, uh, we reviewed this in 2008 and came up with uh, 17 papers that looked at the longitudinal association between depressive symptoms at baseline and the growth or the change in cognitive function over time. Uh, but, are they related? Is the disability of depression related to the cognitive impairments of depression, or are they independent of each other? So, you've got to get to structural equation models for that. Uh, what I like about these things is they look intimidating, but they really tell you a lot. And specifically, what they can tell you is what you can't measure directly. <laughs> Uh, there is no test for the disability mediated through uh, cognition of depression, right? You have depression ratings, you've got cognitive tests, but how do you show that they're uh, related? And the way that you can do that is create a latent variable. Uh, I call it D for dementia. It's this funny Greek letter, the Greek letter D or delta. And what D is, is the variance in cognition that is in fact related to functional status. And uh, independent of that, you get G. G is the variance in cognition that is not related to functional status. You get F. F is the variance in functional status that is not related to cognition. Neither of those are dementing. The only dementing variance is the fraction of variance in functional status that is in fact related to cognition. That's D. And D, I don't know if you can read it in the back, but D correlates very, very strongly, almost perfectly, with the clinician's impression of whether you're demented or not. So I can measure D through this technique and assign my patient a D score, if you want, and that score will tell you if he's demented. It has a lot of other advantages. It means you can rank order everybody in America for how demented they are, right? Because D is a continuous measure. It's like a, a dimensional trait, like height. Everybody has a height. Some people are tall. It's an empirical question what we believe tallness is. And we can define somewhere along the height dimension where everybody taller than this is tall. Right? Well, you could treat dementia the exact same way now. And uh, everybody is demented, a little bit, right? Uh, but there's some threshold where a doctor says, okay, that's clinical, that's dementia now. Uh, and if you're one step on the other side of the line, you don't have dementia yet. And so we can completely empirically uh, quantify the dementia state of a patient and then start to use that as how to think about them. You can see if people cross the line. You can see if they go back, right? And uh, you can predict from how close they are to the line how long they've got before they're going to turn into a clinically recognizable dementia case. Here, uh, these are called ROC curves. When you're uh, testing how good a test is, you can uh, to predict a category like dementia, then uh, you uh, use this kind of statistic. It's called an ROC curve. And uh, a perfect diagnostic test would have an ROC score of 1.0. D's ROC is 0.99. It's almost perfect. So I can build the D score from a cognitive battery, and, uh, and it is almost as good as bringing them into clinic and having a clinician look at them. It's so good, in fact, that you probably don't need clinicians anymore. Because you'll have the D score, the D score is perfect. It's just a question of where along this D dimension do you want to draw the line and say that uh, dementia starts. And for that, we just ask the experts. Uh, we just have them look at the patient and go, when do you think he's demented? And the expert goes, there, he's demented. And then we note the D score. And uh, if all the experts agree, we can uh, derive a D score above which you're demented. So that's what we're doing. G 
is the rest of cognition. It's actually 80% of the variance in any cognitive battery. And that fraction has no relation at all to dementia. So what that's telling you is that most of the information you obtain by any cognitive screening is actually irrelevant to whether your patient is disabled and therefore whether they're demented. Only a small fraction is related to disability, but that fraction is D. So if I can measure that fraction specifically, I don't need the rest of the information because it's really irrelevant, it's confusing you, right? And that's why I've been in this business, you know, 25 years, and people still ask me what I think the best screening test for dementia is. You'd think they would have figured it out by now. Right? I mean, you had 25 years, why didn't you figure it out? <laughs> and that's because there can never be an answer for that. The raw test scores are never going to let us diagnose dementia accurately. Only through a latent variable can I get you to the piece of the raw test score that is actually related to disability, and that little piece I mean, predicts dementia almost perfectly relative to clinicians. So uh, now I don't need the clinicians anymore. Also <laughs> notice that F has no relationship. It's not very strong as a predictor of dementia. Uh, if you flipped a coin, you'd get an ROC curve of 0.5. So F's contribution is 0.59. It's not much better than flipping a coin. And that's the variance in functional status uh, IDLs or ADLs that is not related to cognition. And it turns out that that's mostly the basic activities of daily living. Uh, the ones that are related to cognition are the instrumental activities of daily living, and this analysis bears that out. <coughs> so, once I got D, I have dementia in a bottle, because I can give everybody in America a D score, right? And it's a continuous variable, which means I can get its biomarkers. So here is imaging. These are the parts of the brain whose atrophy is related to your D-score. And this atrophy is not random. This atrophy is the default mode network. It has a name. It's a network in the brain. So what this is saying is that only a little piece of your cognitive performance is related to dementia, but that piece lives in the default mode network. So any... Uh, disease process which affects the default mode network and its functions is likely to screw up your D-score and render you demented. You're not demented until tangles reach the default mode network. You're not demented by them unless they reach your default mode network. And what that means is that your dementia status has nothing to do with the total burden of plaques and tangles in your brain anymore. Now it becomes the plaques and tangles of a single network. And if that network is intact, you're not going to be demented even though you have tangles. And you shouldn't be so shocked at that because the truth is, everybody has tangles. I mean, that's going to be the problem of all this fancy brain imaging, is we're going to image people and find that everybody in the room has tangles. So which one of us are demented? Right? And that's coming from this misunderstanding that dementia is somehow related to the total numbers growing on your brain like mushrooms, but that's not actually what they do. They appear to invade your brain following the wiring. And in the case of Alzheimer's, the tangles are following the wiring of the first cranial nerve, which is your sense of smell. They enter the brain through the organs of smell and begin eating backwards into the brain and eventually they find your default mode network and that's the day you become demented. But that day might be 10 or 15 years down the road. And in those entire 15 years, you do have plaques and tangles in your brain, but they're not anywhere important. See, so you might lose your sense of smell, but who cares? When was the last time you checked your patient's sense of smell? Right? But. Uh, your sense of smell does predict your future dementia conversion risk. And uh, I check the smell of our patients all the time because uh, if you tell me your patient has Alzheimer's and they can still smell, you have to go back and redo the diagnosis because that's not how Alzheimer's works. Anyway, it turns out that the default mode network is abnormal in depression as well as Alzheimer's disease. So uh, here in blue are the parts of the brain related to the default mode network. And uh, different uh, studies have shown uh, abnormalities in these regions in the case of uh, depression. And in depression, the default mode network is not 
hypoactive, it's actually hyperactive. Now, this default mode network, we'll talk about that for a second. Uh, they called it the default mode network. They discovered it through imaging. And they called it the default mode network because it was on in the control groups where people are just lying in the brain scanner doing nothing. And somebody said, oh, well, this is the default mode. This is the brain's just basic operating mode. And then when the psychologist gives you a test, this network should turn off and other networks turn on to solve the problem. And that's why cognitive testing has such a hard time detecting who's actually demented, because you're interrogating the wrong networks by definition. As soon as you ask the guy who's the president, what day of the week it is, anything like that, the default mode network should turn off. And you're not asking the right questions now. See? So that's why much of the variance in any cognitive battery is actually not related to functional status and therefore dementia. Uh, on the other hand, in depression, it doesn't turn off. It's too active. It's on all the time. It gets in the way of the other networks and it screws them up that way. Right? Uh, now, uh, it's not literally true that no task activates the default of the network. Slowly, they've become to realize that the tasks that activate the default mode network are related to autobiographical detail, what you might call self-report, right? So what it means is that demented people have bad default mode networks, so they cannot give self-report, and you already know that's true. You don't believe the self-report of demented people, right? Do you believe the pain ratings of people in nursing homes? You ask them, are you in pain? And they go, no. And then you move them and they go, ah! like that, they have a broken arm, right? There are people with broken arms and they, they won't ask for pain medicine, right? They deny that they have memory loss. I don't have memory loss, me, I don't have memory loss, right? That's because they're demented, and to be demented, they had to lose the default mode network, see? Alzheimer's patients do not use the pronoun I when they talk. The use of the pronoun I dries up as you become demented. But depression is like anti-Alzheimer's. There, you turn inward, and every thought you have is about moi. And so, I hurt, I'm in pain, they did that to me, I am suffering. You see all the I words? They use I all the time, because this network is dysfunctioning by being hyperactive. You see? But still, it's dysfunctioning, that screws up uh, cognition, but this also explains why there's a pervasive, what's called anosognosia, in demented cases. They don't, they don't appreciate their jeopardy, and so you cannot trust their self-report. So don't go around asking them if they were satisfied by their care at the VA, <laughs> because you're asking demented people to give self-report, and you can't trust it. You see? So, uh, Oh, this just summarizes some of the activations that are uh, abnormal in depression. But basically, trust me, it, it, uh, it affects the default mode network. And here are the parts of the brain uh, whose activity is altered by antidepressant treatment. And these are the parts that are in the default mode network. So antidepressants are, in fact, modulating default mode network function. And my argument is, if we can modulate the default mode network through these uh, pharmacological interventions, maybe we should think about getting them to dementia cases. Uh, here are the places in the brain on uh, the right that are uh, deactivated or suppressed by antidepressant <coughs> treatment. And on the left, I can show you that those are the very same regions that are responsible for your D-score. You see? So once again, Antidepressant treatment modulates activity in the default mode network, and that is the one network whose dysfunction is relevant to the cognitive correlates of functional status and therefore uh, dementia. Now, our approach to this, uh, so far I've been kind of showing you dementia, but our approach to this is modular. So uh, on the left is a model where we create D, and we're, we're making D out of five cognitive tests starting with animals, that's animal fluency, and Boston is the Boston naming test. Uh, really, it doesn't matter at all which test we use to build D. We can build D out of any cognitive battery. I've built successful D models out of simply items off a single test. 
just give me five items off the mini I can build E out of that. What if I could do those five items over the phone? Then I could diagnose your dementia with almost perfect accuracy from a telephone interview that would last three minutes. So we're building models like that and trying to write grants to convince people. Anyway, in this case, uh, D is the variance shared between this brief cognitive battery and what's called the MCI ADL scale. So we're in the model on the left. That's a functional status measure. Okay. And D correlates 0.94, which means really good, with dementia severity as rated by an expert blind clinician on what's called the CDR, the Clinical Dementia Rating Scale Sum of Boxes. But that's a state-of-the-art measure used in all the clinical trials and the Alzheimer's centers to stage uh, dementia and, and rate its severity. So my D score built out of a brief battery and a functional status measure can essentially eliminate the need for the clinician to fill out the CDR. Filling out the CDR is a piece of work. It might take 45 minutes. You have to interview the patient, the caregiver, and review a cognitive assessment battery. And do all that and then do the voodoo, whatever the clinician expert does, that makes him shake all that information together and say, yes, this is dementia. Right? And so uh, this uh, latent variable D correlates 0.95 with that. That means it's so good you could just eliminate the clinician and you'll get the same answer. Now, let's take the same model and just change one thing. All we're going to do is get rid of functional status and put in a depression scale, the geriatric depression scale. And that one change means that we're not talking about D anymore, we're talking about the cognitive correlates of your GDS score. So it's an empirical question whether that has anything to do with the cognitive correlates of functional status. Right? But in fact, DEPCOG, let's just call it that now, DEPCOG has the same correlation with the de dementia rating that the D score did. And that's telling you that they're very, very much alike. The cognitive correlates of mood are the cognitive correlates of functional status. That's why depression is a disabling condition. And what that means is that depression <laughs> is a dementing condition that is affecting the very same network that is responsible for your D scores. Here's the correlation between the depth cog factor uh, on the Y axis and the D factor on the X, and it's almost perfect. They, they correlate very, very strongly. And this is in uh, uh, the Texas Alzheimer's Research Consortium, so this is uh, maybe uh, 1,800 uh, characterized cases in older people with normal cognition, MCI, or dementia. So what this is saying is the cognitive correlates of depression are dementing and can substitute for uh, a latent variable that represents the cognitive correlates of disability. So here is the parts of the brain that are, whose atrophy is related to your D score. So this was built with a battery that would take a, a psychologist an hour and a half to accomplish. And we took all that information and built D, and then we imaged where in the brain it lives, and this is essentially the default mode hour. Here is the cognitive correlates of uh, your GDS score from a much briefer cognitive battery that would take uh, the uh, psychometrician now uh, 15 or 20 minutes to do. And you can see, you can just look at it and see it's the same network in the brain. And in pink on the right are the, uh, is the overlap between the depth cognitive variable and the D variable, built from the same, uh, the same battery. So you can see that they're essentially the same. So that means to me, if it walks like a duck, it's a duck. It means that the cognitive correlates of your mood are, in fact, dementing because they represent the cognitive correlates of functional status. And that's why the differential between depression and Alzheimer's is clinically not trivial. It's, it's actually hard to uh, say confidently that, that this is Alzheimer's as opposed to depression. And that's why depression got the reputation for being somehow pseudo-Alzheimer's. The only thing pseudo about it is that depression doesn't act through plaques and tangles. But the cognitive effects of depression are themselves dementing and add to any dementia that you're experiencing from your plaques and tangles. 
So we should acknowledge that uh, and treat <laughs> the dementia of depression as though it were an actual dementia. And then maybe get some ideas about how to treat tangle-related dementia in the same network uh, from drugs that we know make the functional dementia of depression uh, better. Another interesting thing is that uh, there seems to be, uh, you know, I'm, I'm kind of exaggerating this by this line, but I just want you to notice, I'm, I have a graphical line, uh, controls in Alzheimer's cases are on the less depressed side of the line, but the MCI cases are on the more depressed side of the line. And what that's telling you, I think, is that uh, this subsyndromal depression of the MCI is a notable feature that we should pay attention to. Uh, now, the fault mode network is activated by autobiographical tasks, and it's overactive in depression, and self-awareness is lost as the fault mode network uh, succumbs to your tangle formation. And uh, uh, another thing to notice here is that depression itself, right, your assessment of somebody's depression is mostly rated through self-report, and so it's vulnerable to, uh, uh, you know, function of the fault mode network. Anyway, on the left is, uh, we can scan for amyloid, and uh, what I want to show you is that amyloid deposition is not random. The amyloid is being deposited specifically in the default mode network. And so look at the homology between these two scans. On the left is uh, PET imaging of the distribution of amyloid lesions, and on the right are the hubs of the default mode network uh, elicited through a different technique. And you can see how similar these two scans are. So amyloid, uh, we know, is being deposited in the default mode network, and that begins before you become demented. That's there five or 10 years before you're demented, which is why they hope to, uh, you know, they're, they're thinking to emphasize uh, preclinical stages of Alzheimer's and maybe fix the amyloid at that phase. But my point is, it's in the key network, uh, a network that is hyperactive in depression before you're demented in the MCI phase. And it looks like A beta increases the function of the default mode network. It doesn't diminish it. So uh, what I think that's going to look like clinically is subsyndromal depression. It's going to remind you of depression. It's pseudo-depression. Uh, very few of these people meet DSM criteria for card-carrying major depression with melancholia, and guilt, and self-depreciation. Uh, they have some mild depression. You know, they look a little cranky. Uh, they're dysphoric. Uh, they're a little bit apathetic. So it shows up in the depression uh, ratings and the clinician's impression as maybe a mild depression. But uh, that might be an artifact of changes to default mode network uh, structure or function that are attended to the preclinical deposition of amyloid in the very same network. So we've been looking at stuff like this through uh, data from the Texas Alzheimer's Research Consortium, which is funded by the state of Texas and uh, uh, is studying uh, uh, aging, I guess, vaguely. Uh, uh, and preclinical Alzheimer's and then clinical Alzheimer's in five uh, UT, I mean five uh, Texas medical schools. So right now, TARC has over 2,000 subjects. A third of them are Hispanic. We have comprehensive annual psychometric exams, full genetic panels, and uh, uh, a panel of 150 serum protein and inflammatory biomarkers. And by the way, the the TARC data set is meant to be available to investigators anywhere in Texas. And so uh, uh, it's going to start funding pilot studies soon, but, but basically being at a Texas institution, anyone interested in Alzheimer's can apply to get a hold of the data and do secondary data now. And so we're building what are called MIMIC models. And this is a MIMIC model where we created the, on the right, out of uh, a cognitive battery and the dementia severity measure. And then uh, at the bottom is a, a biomarker, in this case one, a protein in the serum called resistin. And now, in the MIMIC model, we can ask ourselves, is your serum resistance score related to cognition? And if it is, is that association mediated through G, through D, through both, or through neither? 
right? And I can test all those things simultaneously in a single model. And when you put that in, what you see is that uh, resistant is related to cognition through D, also through G, and also for two of the tests, trail making, uh, directly through neither one of the other two, right? Now, look at this here. Uh, resistant is positively related to your D-score, but your D-score is inversely related to cognition. And not only that, D is the only piece of cognition in this entire model that is in fact related to your dementia severity. So, resistant is dementing you through its strong effects on D, but simultaneously, it's strongly related to the G-score. And the G-score is positively related to cognition. But those effects have nothing to do with dementia severity, right? But they have everything to do with the observed test score that you got. So on your test score, you have lost a few points because of D, and you gained a few points because of G. They wash each other out, and you decide that his testing is probably pretty normal. Nonetheless, he's being demented by resistance effects on the D-score, and it's hard to see that in the raw numbers, which is why the raw numbers can't be trusted for this kind of analysis. You have to use uh, latent variables. So what we can do, TARC has 150 of these proteins. We could systematically go through all 150 and come up with a panel of maybe 10, maybe 15, which in their aggregate determine your D-score and therefore your dementia status. And suddenly, we have either a blood test for your D-score, or we know the biomarkers that are mediating your D-score specifically, and that might tell us something about what's really going on in Alzheimer's, or it might offer opportunities to throw a monkey wrench in there, block one of these proteins, and then you'd be treating the D-score by preventing its deterioration uh, related specifically to one or the other of these biomarkers. So, what if we just swap out functional status and in the same approach put in depression ratings? Then suddenly D isn't D anymore, now it's depth cog, now it's the cognitive correlates of your mood, and we can do the whole exercise over going through 150 different serum proteins, finding which ones mediate the relationship between your mood and your cognition. And we already know that that's a disabling and potentially dementing proposition, right? So I did it for you. And uh, 36 of 150 proteins in TARC are, have effects on the D-score. Most of those are you know, more or less strong. I don't mean that in a statistical uh, uh, way, but I mean that they're relatively powerful. So anything above 0.3 would be explaining you know, 9 or 10 percent of the variance in your dementia severity. And, uh, and then there's 36 of these proteins to play with. Uh, 24 of the 36 were adverse, meaning if you had high levels of those proteins, then you were being demented by depressive symptoms. And 12 of 36 were protective. So that could give you clues about what's really going on in depression and who's got it and uh, what proteins you would want to emphasize to uh, counteract it. Simultaneously, 15 of these 36 had effects on G, and in every case, the effect on G was in the opposite direction of the effect on D, which means you're never going to figure this out without a latent variable approach, because whatever you see in the raw test scores is the sum of two independent streams of information, the biomarkers effect on D and the biomarkers effect on G, and they are canceling each other out. So the raw test score cannot uh, disentangle these sorts of issues. And a further insight that comes from this work, we know that D maps to a network. Uh, we haven't done G yet, but I'll bet you G is some other networks. So these are pretty big proteins. They're probably not crossing the blood-brain barrier. So how exactly do they affect the function of individual networks? It can't be that they're inflaming the brain you know, that things are, you know, crossing the blood-brain barrier and actually eating neurons, because you'd imagine that they might uh, inflame the whole brain. Why would they inflame the default mode network and not the hippocampus, for example? You see? So it's probably not working like that. I think they're signaling networks. These proteins are talking to networks. 
and turning them on and off. Specific networks, individual networks, and possibly conflicting, turning one on while it turns another one off, so that you get what we uh, see clinically, and it's the result of the individual actions of proteins, inflammatory proteins, on networks. And what that might mean is that these changes are reversible because they don't necessarily require any plaques or tangles to be constructed. And like I showed you in the early on in this talk, the effect of depression on cognition is as bad as the effects of amyloid, but it's independent of those lesions. You see? So, uh, so basically, this might mean that dementia due to these proteins is reversible. And it's just that we're not thinking about it that way, so we haven't tried it yet. So uh, I think there's some uh, good news here. So basically, depression has effects on cognition. These are not mediated through neurodegeneration. Uh, it has effects on functional status, and those are probably specifically mediated through depression's association with default mode network uh, dysfunction. Uh, depression and a beta alters the functions of the default mode network and either imitate each other's effects. So you could think of depression as a dementing condition, or you might think of beta amyloid deposition as a potentially depressing condition, right? But either way, that's probably why clinicians all over the world are associating low levels of depressive symptoms with what later converts to Alzheimer's dementia uh, down the road. And Arguably, because if it walks like a duck, it's a duck, you should start to appreciate the dementing nature of depression and quit thinking about it just as a mood disorder. You are not treating mood. Mood does not put you back to work. Cognitive impairment disables you. You see? So how do we know that antidepressants make dementia better? We don't really. We, we know that they're all FDA-approved make your mood better. But does that mean you're less demented? You know, it, it might be if we actually set that experiment up that some antidepressants, maybe not all of them, are anti-dementia drugs, and other ones aren't. In, in uh, you know, in my experience, we're, we're using uh, uh, Zoloft, sertraline, off-label to treat the dementia of vascular disease. Uh, so that's essentially what we're doing. So, uh, so basically, uh, uh, there, the, none of these drugs are indicated to treat dementia right now, but I think arguably we could understand uh, these as dementing illnesses and therefore as their, their treatments as potentially anti dementia So uh, why should we wait for drugs that may or may not ever come to improve dementia by reversing the plaques and the tangles when we have a completely independent source of variance in dementia severity, which is uh, potentially remediable through FDA-approved agents in off-label applications. So basically, we just have to change the way we think about depression, and then it uh, will be obvious how we should proceed. Thank you. Any questions? the fault mode network is schizophrenia, right? And maybe we should be thinking of the dementia of schizophrenia, too. Uh, but I guess that would be why they called it dementia precox, right? <laughs> the first name for schizophrenia was dementia precox. Now think about that. You think about dementia as cognitive impairment. But in 1903, when uh, Craig named dementia precox, dementia precox, he wasn't really thinking of cognitive impairment because you know, psychologists, psychologists had uh, invented cognitive tendency. Oh, you're here. I'm hearing voices. <laughs> but what's interesting is it in the slideshow. Is it the word of So that's the The words of, uh, for dementia is actually four hundred years old. But uh, the psychometric enterprise, if you will, is about 150 years old. So what did they mean by dementia before anybody understood there was such a thing as memory and that you could test it? Oh, he said the end of his show. Right. And the, uh, the, uh, the answer is dementia was disability due to mental illness. Right. 
It wasn't, it had nothing to do with cognition because they didn't know what cognition was. I mean, they hadn't invented that concept yet. So the original uh, root of the word dementia, it was applied to disabilities due to cognitive impairment, I mean, due to mental disorders. Mm -hmm. And uh, schizophrenia and depression both are disabling mental conditions. Well, it turns out that both of them affect the default mode network. And so I think the unifying theme is that this disability due to a mental or cognitive disorder is probably mediated through this one network. And that's why you can recognize features of Alzheimer's disease in people who don't really have plaques or tangles. As a matter of fact, schizophrenics, regardless of the fact that you might diagnose them with dementia in old age, uh, they, don't, they don't make plaques and tangles. Schizophrenia uh, somehow appears to protect the brain from tangle formation. So as they get older, they, don't, they develop dementia, but it's not mediated through plaques or tangles. Thanks, everyone.